Hi everyone, welcome to Critical Faculty. We return, uh, but this time uh, in English. Um, just 20 minutes ago, I was live in Arabic and I've got to rewire the brains pretty quickly and, uh, and think in a different language. <laughs> and I uh, would like to welcome to the studio the magnificent uh, Dr. Price. Hello, Bob, how are you? Oh, doing great. Uh, you know, it's a good thing you uh, said that uh, you were switching over to English since I'm about to get into such a flood of gibberish that the <laughs> audience may not readily recognize it as English. So, <laughs> Well, fair enough, fair enough. It's uh, Well, the, the, the topic we're introducing today is one uh, that people uh, seem to waffle on quite a bit because you got very, very contrasting uh, opinions from... Well, Paul is the one who actually founded Christianity um, uh, all the way, and he is the responsible for everything that Christianity is today, all the way to, no, he was just um, one of the guys and the cronies uh, who helped uh, the movement along. Uh, but I want to start with the big question um, of them all, um, or the biggest of them all. Um, do, you, did you, do you think uh, Paul actually ever existed? Yeah, I do. And for an odd sort of a reason, I mean, one would think, well, of course, obviously he must have existed because otherwise who wrote all these letters? <coughs> but once you factor in uh, the, uh, the problems with the authenticity of ancient writings and the common use of uh, pseudepigraphy, that is uh, false names, uh, whether you were trying to deceive the reader or just say, what would so-and-so say? I mean, this is widespread uh, to a great degree, so automatically that raises questions. Do we actually have uh, the uh, the literary record of, of a thinker, well, it's not unreasonable, and many uh, very uh, intelligent scholars think so. It's the traditional view. There are debates over, well, did Paul write some of these or all of them? How could you tell? And, and so on. But then there's also the question of uh, narrative sources, uh, like especially the, uh, the Book of Acts, uh, the Acts of the Apostles, but also some other works that, uh, that that are dismissed as apocryphal, like the the Acts of Paul, a whole separate and a whole very long book, and and yet other ones uh, where where he is a major figure, Acts of Peter and Paul, and and uh, so on. And then Josephus, it, it looks like Josephus, though it's not clear that he mentions Jesus apparently in my reckoning does mention paul but and this is really the weird part of it what he says about a character named simon implies that he's talking about the one we know of as paul and uh who is represented uh, under the uh the uh, mask of simon magus elsewhere so it's it gets very complicated. In fact, it, it's almost more of a of a complicated mystery than the historical Jesus question. Uh, in fact, it, it's so parallel. Uh, I was uh, part of the Jesus seminar for some years, and what we did there in all the sessions twice a year was to uh, put under the microscope the various sayings and stories in the Gospels and try to debate now does this look authentic or is there a problem with anachronism here uh, <laughs> is this something that given the general picture of jesus and the gospels that it would be hard to, to reconcile like if there if there store if there are sayings where jesus is warning about the imminent danger of persecution does that really fit the general narrative in which it occurs, in which Jesus is not yet um, uh, considered an enemy of the Roman Empire uh, and, and so on? It is, no, it kind of fits later. Maybe somebody is saying, what would Jesus say about our current dilemma? And sheesh, same thing with, uh, with Paul. 
uh, and uh, or there are contradictions uh, between what Jesus says about fasting in one place and uh, versus another. Well, you got the same thing in the Pauline epistles, like First Corinthians. Oh my gosh, what a what a bottle of headaches this is! Uh, that uh, where you have uh, in one chapter, it's arguing for the notion that apostles can make a secular living uh, from their uh, supporters. And in the next, it says, oh, no, we, we never do that because people will get the wrong idea. In one chapter, uh, women can speak and prophesy in the congregation, but in another of the same letter, they can't. Uh, and does, does Paul use philosophy and advanced wisdom According to this chapter, yes. According to this one, no. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, oh my gosh, what did well, it's, you it's very right? confusing. So, um, Bob, um, uh, the um, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, I'm trying to remember some numbers here, but the New Testament is made of 27 books, uh, mm -hmm. out of which I think 14 might have, might be attributed to Paul. But we think the the, the fur, uh, seven of them can might be the authentic ones. That's the mainstream view of critics, uh, people that, that are not naive about it and, and uh, are convinced that, uh, that um, well, uh, virtually everybody agrees that uh, Paul is not even supposed to be the author of the epistle to the Hebrews. There's no mm -hmm. name on it. Uh, and it's the kind of thing where whoever wrote the other 13 probably wouldn't have had any problem with this, but it's not the same sort of thinking in it and so on. So that Hebrews is out. Uh, and, and the other um, uh, six have various problems with them. They sound too Gnostic or one thing or another. So most think that uh, that the authentic ones are Romans, Galatians, First and Second Corinthians, um, Philippians, First Thessalonians, and the tiny little letter Philemon, and um, but there have always been dissenting voices and with pretty good arguments. F. C. Bauer in the nineteenth century said, "No, no, no. I'm afraid only four of those, the so-called Hauptbriefe, the principal epistles." First and Second Corinthians, Romans, and Galatians. Only these uh, were by Paul. Uh, and then um, Bruno Bauer and W. C. Van Manen and the Dutch radical critics said, "Hold on, uh, you stopped short. If you apply the same criteria, I'm afraid you will find that none of these go back." to any Apostle Paul. They they all appear to be second century works written in his name, which sounds like crazy stuff, like denying that the moon landing happened. But in fact, uh, there there's good reasons for it. And, uh, and since, for instance, there are loads of works attributed to Simon Peter that no critical scholar accepts as authentic. Uh, you got the Apocalypse of Peter, the Gospel of Peter, the preachings of uh, Peter, the journeys of Peter, uh, the uh, first, second, third, and fourth epistles of Peter, and so on. No, nobody thinks that he wrote these. It's just he was a big name, and so there, somebody's claiming it to lend some authority to their works. Well, if Peter, why not Paul? I mean, it, it at least opens the question of, are we so sure any of these go back to uh, a Paul if there was one? And so some people have gone to the extreme of saying that there wasn't any Apostle Paul. Uh, I don't go that far. I, I'm not even sure what that would mean, actually. Uh, because I don't want to get off on this, but the notion of a mythic Paul is is more puzzling than that of a mythic Jesus. Yes, I agree. Okay. Jesus would fit as a myth because of the dying and rising God thing. I'm not sure, you know, what, what the, who would have made up Paul? So here's what I think, which sounds even wackier, perhaps, that... Uh, that the one we call Paul 
uh, was the same as the one known to history and legend is Simon Magus. And some of the biggest clues to this are in the book of Acts, uh, which says that he was called Paul and he was called Saul, which sort of uh, disappears almost as uh, soon as it's uh, brought up. And there are hints that um, that he's the same as the character depicted as Simon Magus, who in Samaria uh, tries to become a colleague of the apostles and, and uh, tries to buy from Peter the secret of dispensing the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands, which Peter hotly repudiates and says, you have no role in this. And in fact, I can see right now where you're headed. Uh, you're about to be chained up with the, the bonds of gall and bitterness and so forth. Uh, as um, uh, as the Tubingen critics of the 19th century pointed out, this sounds strangely like uh, something in the epistle to the Galatians, where Paul says that he visited Jerusalem to speak with the pillars, James, Peter, and uh, John, uh, and uh, he received recognition for his apostolic work. Okay, we're doing something slightly different, but you're okay with us. Uh, but there is this little matter of uh, support. Uh, we're, we're a small shrinking group. Uh, we've shared everything. And you know what happens when people embrace socialism. You run out of other people's money, as Margaret Thatcher said. So if you could uh, see it in your heart to do some fundraising among your considerable following out there in all these these Greek cities, uh, that that would really be great. And it's kind of like a, um, a gentleman's agreement. And uh, Paul said, I was wholly too happy to oblige. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Was, was this a euphemistic way of saying you can buy your way into apostolic recognition? So you'll now be like one of us if the price is right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but then, and with the, we read that Paul does make the collection. It pops up in the different epistles and so on. Uh, you know, don't leave me uh, looking like a liar here. Uh, we, I need you guys to cough up the money and so forth. But then he says in Romans, well, I'm ultimately headed for Jerusalem. And boy, I sure hope they're going to accept this money. Uh, wait a minute. Why would they not? Uh, something has happened in the meantime. And uh, even in the book of Acts, it kind of looks like he brings this money and it's rejected and he narrowly escapes with his life. Uh, like, what is happening here? Uh, and then you start reading later work. I'm sorry this is so complicated, but, but it is a puzzle with many pieces. Uh, you read about clashes between Peter and Simon Magus. Uh, well, over what? Well, Simon, quote unquote, says that he is an apostle of Christ. And Peter says, what are you talking about? You, you never even met him. Uh, we traveled with him. We, we heard it right from the horse's mouth. What, you, you had some vision? Who knows? Maybe you ate something too spicy the night before. What, what are you kidding? If you were a real apostle, you'd agree with us. And, and Simon says, no, wait, you're naive. You know how easy it is to misunderstand what you hear someone say. And in fact, take a look at the Gospel of Mark, where the disciples constantly misunderstand Jesus. Yes. I said, Whereas if you have a vision, it's from one mind to another. It's like telepathy. There's no doubt remaining. And yeah. uh, well, what is it that Paul, what was the bone of contention beyond that? Why were they reluctant to accept him as an apostle? Well, because they teach that Christians must keep the Torah. But but Simon said, oh, no, you don't. It was given by angels. You're under no obligation to keep it, which uh, suspiciously is just what Paul says in Galatians. Uh, mm -hmm. We're saved by the grace of God. 
uh, whoa, uh, what is going on here? And, and uh, then on top of that, and I'll, I'll leave it with this, um, Josephus tells us that there was this jet set group of um, people tied in with the house of Herod. Uh, there were a couple of uh, Roman procurators, uh, Felix and Festus, who were mentioned in the book of Acts, uh, one after the other, and their wives, Drusilla and Bernice, and uh, that uh, they had with them in their entourage a magician named Simon, and uh, that he had in advised one of the women to leave her husband and uh, marry some guy who was not circumcised. What's that? You don't need to be circumcised? Well, Paul is associated with the same people, the same group of names in the book of Acts. People that uh, listen to him gladly and, and so forth, uh, that don't persecute him. And um, it, it gets more and more into the weeds, but Okay, one more little note. Uh, some Jewish scholars have said that there was a character that Josephus calls the Egyptian, some sort of messianic prophet who, had, who was a Jew who had studied in Egypt and then came back and led a bunch of uh, rebels. And uh, they don't give him a name. But in the book of Acts, Paul is about to be flogged by the Roman authorities who think he is the Egyptian who escaped. Uh, and uh, we got him now. Hey, you, you're that Egyptian, right? He says, and he doesn't say no. He just pulls rank and says, well, you know, here's my Roman citizen card. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, why bring that up unless you're trying to rebut somebody's belief that Paul was the Egyptian and that and some Jewish scholars again say that that would fit Simon Magus whom the pseudo Clementine writings say had uh, been in Egypt at the time his master John the Baptist died and then succeeded him and started the whole thing oh my gosh it's complicated but not really that confusing you just have to put the puzzle pieces out there and so so I think that these guys were right. Uh, the F.C. Bauer and Gustav Volkmar and all these guys, and, and in our day, Hermann Dettering, uh, gone now, sadly, that uh, there was a historical Paul, but uh, he was uh, also known as Simon, uh, Simon Magus, and that he, he might have written some of the letters attributed to Paul, uh, but uh, it almost doesn't matter because it looks like Marcion perhaps got the, the, the wagon rolling with writing in the name of Paul. Uh, the, the, the letters would be pseudonymous, uh, but they would be fathered on to um, um, Paul, who, they're, who is being separated from Simon because of uh, the split between the factions of the church. Uh, like, why, why does the book of Acts have both Paul and Simon, one a good guy and one the bad guy? Well, because Acts is written as a kind of an ecumenical uh, reconciliation document in the mid to late second century, where they're trying to uh, uh, reconcile with all the Gnostics and Marcionites, Paulinists, and, and saying, look, why don't you come back to the fold? Yeah, we got these awful stories about uh, this guy uh, known as Simon, uh, but let's not confuse him with good old Paul, the, the uh, safe apostle. Uh, so I, I, it seems to me it is obviously speculative. I don't have a time machine in the garage, don't even have a garage, uh, so I can't go back and, and find out. But if, if it seems to me like uh, what what the uh, Jesus says, one will be taken, the other will be left, and the disciples say, "Taken where?" And Jesus says, "Well, where do you think? Uh, wherever the vultures are circling, that's where you'll find the body." In other words, where there's smoke, there's fire. Do all of these odd little dovetailing bits of data 
amount to nothing or, or do they mean something? Because if the latter is so, I think I know what that something is. And I've never heard another uh, way of putting the pieces that, together. Yeah. So, Bob, I mean, even though we might think that Paul might have been an actual person, uh, uh, but uh, uh, unlike Jesus, you said Jesus had that um, sort of... Um, uh, the myth behind the, the man, you know, the miracles, the, the all the uh, incredible stuff that were uh, being, um, uh, you know, sort of acted upon and during his, um, uh, before his um, uh, resurrection and after his resurrection. While Paul, uh, in my opinion, still uh, give you the in the in the superhero narrative, uh, the redemption story. Each uh, religion, I can tell you from experience of even Islam, and I bet you Judaism will have the same thing, about a guy who was a, a staunch pr prosecutor, the one who uh, it was your worst nightmare, worst enemy of the movement, just to, to do a 180-degree turnaround and become the strongest defender of the very thing that he used to fight. Mm. Uh, and you can see that in a lot of, of narratives. And whether that narrative narrative needed to be installed using multiple personalities, a Frankenstein of ideas have been put together to, to, to create that one character? Uh, well, yeah. And in fact, uh, the... Uh with the very thing you mentioned, the radical turnabout, uh, he who once persecuted us now came to embrace the, the faith he tried to destroy. The two, you know, the three times the book of Acts tells the story in slightly different uh, versions of Paul's conversion. Uh, and uh, if you look closely at it and start looking at other contemporary literature, it seems to me that the, these uh, Paul conversion stories are lifted from two well-known stories where something similar happens. One is in Euripides' famous play, The Bacchae, which was around for centuries before Luke ever was, was born, right? And in that one, King Pentheus uh, is trying to uh, to arrest and, and silence uh, the apostle of the cult of Dionysus, who actually turns out to be Dionysus. And there's so many details uh, that, that seem uncomfortably close that uh, many scholars think, yeah, yeah, the, Luke was borrowing heavily from, uh, from the Bacchae and Acts. And then there is Second Maccabees chapter 3, where uh, the Seleucid emperor sends... Uh, an, a lieutenant of his, Heliodorus, to Jerusalem to uh, loot the temple at Jerusalem to uh, to pay for all kinds of goodies uh, that the government wanted to do. And he gets to the temple, but suddenly angels knock him off his horse and blind him. Uh, and, uh, and then the Jews don't want to get in further trouble for, for causing his death. So they pray for him and, and tend to him. And he snaps out of it and lo and behold, converts to Judaism. And he goes back uh, to the the king uh, and, and he says, look, here's what happened. I'm sorry I, I couldn't do it, but it's out of the question now. And yeah. the king says, well, would, would you have any advice for anybody else I might send? And he says, yeah, don't go unless you want this to happen to you, to you too. Now, there, there are details I'm not even getting into in both of these cases where it sounds like between the two of them, or really in either one of them, you've got the story of Paul in Acts with, with just the names changed. Uh, and then when you get to um, like the Acts of Paul, for instance, you have um, yet more evolution of the Pauline legend where Paul is martyred uh, and uh, Nero condemns him to death and actually has a guy come in and, and chop his head off uh, and they drag him out. But then minutes later, uh, Paul comes back into the throne room, head right back on, telling Nero, you're next. 
and uh, then he leaves and this time he's really dead and a few days later his disciples go to his tomb outside of rome to mourn but holy mackerel it's open and what there's about, a wing uh, of light and paul ascends into heaven well what the heck what it's like a, he's become another Christ. It's all legend. Before we set the scene for his personality, and, and we have to go by the narrative, but it was another funny one where his head bounced three times, and each time it bounced, it created a, a stream of water, and there is a, a, a three-headed fountain in Italy now named after um, uh, Paul the Apostle um, uh, because his head bounced three times, creating three fountains. <laughs> it's it is incredible. It's, I think it's called uh, Fontania alle Tre uh, oh. di San Paolo in Italy. Uh, it, it's just f fantastic uh, stories. Uh, but let's let's just probe the, the narrative. I mean, before the conversion, uh, first of all, we need to get one apprehension out of the way because a lot of people to date still think that uh, Saul or Shaul has his name changed. Uh, after his conversion, which is not true. My understanding, that is his uh, Jewish name, and that's his Greek name. And people in, in antiquity, especially around that time, uh, I think there's a movement called Hellenistic Jew, where there are Jewish sects that borrowed a little bit from um, Greek culture and incorporated bits and pieces, and therefore people were renowned to have a couple of names, their Jewish name and their Greek name. So correct me if I'm wrong, that wasn't a name after his conversion. He was always known by the two names. It, it, so it implies. I, I think that's probably the best explanation because <clears throat> in chapter 12, after the thing with, the, interestingly, the conversion of the Roman official Sergius Paulus, uh, the, if Saul, as he's been called up to that point, leaves to do further apostolic work. And it says, and Saul, who was also Paul, uh, so and so, and that's all we hear from there on in Paul. It doesn't say he changed his name. Now, I understand why people say that because they're thinking of uh, Jacob changing his name to Israel. Abraham, Abraham to Israel. Sarah. Yeah. 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 And, uh, it's it's yeah. i understand that it's not stupid but but you need to look at it closely as you did now was he ever called saul and some say well probably not uh hermann dettering said he thinks that this is just an attempt to to give paul an old testament grounding by yeah. identifying him with saul uh the king, there, was a, there, was a, there was a king i think uh king saul right yeah and uh, so it, it's possible, but I find it entirely uh, plausible. To It's like Simon Peter. Uh, you ever notice how he's sometimes called in, in a couple of the epistles, Simeon Peter or even Simeon Peter? Well, there were different Greek equivalents um, that uh, if you, like you say, if you had a Jewish name because you're Jewish uh, and you had dealings with Greek speakers in business or whatever, as, as Peter, as a fisherman, certainly would. Do you know, Bob, uh, it, it happens to date. Um, as you know, China is, is, is has become now uh, an exporting sort of nation to the rest of the world. And they have to have a lot of dealings with the Western world. So the Chinese nationals now, will adopt uh, uh, some sort of an English first name. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you go on email and they have the funniest names, and uh, there is a lady that I speak with at work and her name is uh, Fanny. And she doesn't, yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, you get all these, but they, they choose an English name uh, mm -hmm. because it's make, it makes it a lot easier. Also, we have call centers here in Australia and you know, they try to see all sorts of things. And we get a lot of Indian nationals they all happen to have, uh, they, they, I think they're made of names because they're, you know, you get Michael Jackson and Peter Jackson. It, hmm. You can tell they are fake names, you know, uh -huh. and they, they think that they, it will appeal to the Western market by adopting. So it happens to date. And I think it happened then. 
Yeah, they would choose a, a Greek name that sounded somewhat similar. So Simeon is not Greek, but Hebrew, but Simon is a, is a good Greek name. And so he'd go by that. Or uh, if your name was Yeshua, you might go by Jason. Uh, and so yeah. it was very common. And for exactly the reason you, you mentioned, so there, there's nothing all that spooky about that. And it isn't mm -hmm. part of this conversion narrative. It, it occurs later. I mean, if, if it was some kind of thing where you're a new man now, you need a new name. Well, surely that would have happened in chapter nine. Uh, not to three chapters later. So yes. that's just one of these things people, it's like uh, the three wise men showed up at Bethlehem. It never says there were three guys or that they were wise kings or anything. We just read it through the lenses of, of tradition. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Okay. So we know he was a Pharisee and and uh, I think that he, he, he was, it was referenced, it was not much about his family, but we know that he's known to be Paul of Tarsus which is, I think, modern-day uh, Turkey, somewhere yes. around the Mediterranean, close to, to the shore, which is a very open city close to the uh, port. And we know any city that's close to a port or a sea, it's always an outgoing place. It's a place of, of cultures and universities. Hmm. That's right. Actually, there's a little ambiguity in that... Uh, um, well, uh, Hi Makami was an interesting combination of, of being willing to take things literally, uh, but not seriously. Like, for instance, he thought Paul did write all the letters attributed to him, uh, but that when he claims, like in Philippians, to have been a Pharisee, or in the book of Acts, he assumed if it said Paul said it, I guess he did, uh, he said it's just Pharisee, but he was lying about it. Now, that's uh, that's an interesting way of interpreting. I think it's very uh, much more likely that you're deal that, that is part of this this later attempt to Judaize Paul, uh, about part of that reconciliation thing. And here's one place where I agree with Maccabee. In uh, his book, Paul and Hellenism, he says, does Paul really sound? I mean, assuming he wrote the letters, did, did the writer really uh, give evidence of being saturated with Jewish lore. I mean, we're told he was a disciple of Gamaliel, the chief uh, honcho there, but it doesn't sound like it. He says it sounds, whoever wrote these letters sounds more like one of the Gnostics at Nag Hammadi. Uh, the, the strange interpretations and, and uh, oh, um, like this is a counterblast to a famous book by W.D. Davies called Paul and Rabbinic Judaism, where Davies, uh, one of these nice conservative English scholars, said he, he goes, it's a big book, and he says, oh, you see, here's where Paul has common ground with Judaism and so forth. I read the book. I thought, what are you talking about? It's like a mountain labored and brought forth a mouse. Uh, he comes up with negligible results. And uh, and Maccabee shows that too. And he says, my favorite example, um, uh, in second, was it? No, first Corinthians, uh, it speaks of the rock that followed the Israelites in the wilderness and uh, from which they drank, right? And uh, <laughs> Where did you get the idea that there was this, like this beer rolling rock, a rock that fell? Well, because there are two stories of Moses either speaking to a rock or, or striking it. And so the people must have been the same rock. So it must have been. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, well, uh, Paul mentions that. And he says, well, that rock symbolically was Christ. And uh, he's, ah, you see, there's a piece of Jewish lore. Paul would only know that if he was brought up in rabbinic Judaism. And Maccabee says, that's just not true. This is widely known in Hellenistic sources. And in fact, I saw that rock once. Uh, it's called the Stone of Scone. It's in Westminster Abbey. Uh, they, they say that was the rock. So, you know, never met anybody in the Bible, but that's close enough, I guess. Uh, and uh, it's, I think Maccabee is right. It just doesn't sound very Jewish. Uh, yeah. You might say, what there are certain arguments he uses uh, from the lesser to the greater. Like if God's so concerned about oxen, he must 
be concerned about uh, the work of his apostles and all that. That's that's a Greek technique that the rabbis adopted. It, it's it's just uh, they're desperate. So to may, maybe for- maybe what they're trying to do is so trying to emphasize his Jewishness. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, so when they so they're going to contrast it later on. So they they're trying to show you well he's a, was a Pharisee from a family of Pharisees mm-hmm. and they were religious just to because they're building up the drama to show you the contrast later on. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's what I think. I think yeah. you're right. Uh, I think so too. But there were some references that some of his family members, I think he had a nephew and a cousin and some who were Christians. Yeah, th- this is astounding how this gets ignored for the most part. I think it's in Romans 16 where he has this long list of greetings and he says, uh, greet, greet Andronicus and Junia, noteworthy yeah. among the apostles who were in Christ before me. Uh, wait a minute. Are you saying that that preaching the Christian gospel was already a family business? I mean... What about your conversion? What's the deal? I mean, this sounds like uh, a vestige of an alternate understanding of who Ray, Paul was. Uh, Ray reckons his wife. Uh, I don't. I don't know about his wife. I think it's a. It was like a cousin and a nephew of some sort. But a, his wife was was a Christian as well. You reckon, uh, Bob? Uh, well, yeah. The, the it implies it was a married couple. Um, Andronicus and Junia, and uh, the fact that both are said in in the plural to be noteworthy among the apostles, that's that's a double piece of dynamite there, because he's saying that a man and the woman were important apostles, and there's been all sorts of wrangling over that. This is huge. This is huge, because imagine the amount of psychological pressure uh, if you're doing that and you've got all your, your immediate family members and uh, probably a nagging wife who's, <laughs> who's, you know, Christian, and then suddenly you get a vision. Very convenient. <laughs> yeah, that's what happened with uh, Lee Strobel, who wrote The Case for Christ. Uh, that's a perfect parallel. He claims that he was this hardened skeptic, but he decided he would get to the bottom of it and consult a whole bunch of Christian apologists. Uh, and that's all he talks to in the book. Uh, and, and it turns out, no, he, he converted to Christianity because his wife had, and uh, this was all a pose. So what was it like that? Uh, might have been. I mean, it's uh, it, it's just uh, it's got too many weird question marks. In fact, you know, uh, the Ebionite Jewish Christians said Paul wasn't even a Jew. He was a Gentile of some kind who uh, fell in love with the high priest's daughter and, of course, knew he'd have to convert to Judaism to marry her, so he did. But he found it was too difficult. I mean, it was alien mores. What do you mean? I I can't eat ham sandwiches anymore? What? Uh, And uh, so he said, look, I I can't hack this. uh, And I'm sorry, I wasted my time with it, so I'm going to get back at him. Well, now that sounds kind of like gossip, but nonetheless, you got to think of what it says in Corinthians. He says, I became like a Jew in order to preach to Jews, but I also become like a Gentile, one without the Torah, to to, uh, communicate with those who are without it. Wait a minute, what was he originally? I mean, it sounds as if he's saying he wasn't Jewish, but but uh, assumed that persona. I mean, you can't. It's like psychoanalyzing the guy uh, yeah. without having him on the couch. You, you can never know. But but yeah. uh, there are weird pointers in different directions. So let, let's have a look at the the road to Damascus narrative because that's, that's quite interesting. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, we know that he was on the way to Damascus to maybe retrieve some more Christians and bring them bound back to Jerusalem, you know, so he, he was on a mission, he was persecuting, and that very first trip was taken to, to grab some more, uh, you know, uh, trophies uh, back in, to, to, to Jerusalem. And then uh, he gets the, uh, they call it a vision, uh, which is really interesting, because uh, to me, a vision, you got to see, but he was blinded, so, <laughs> you know, it's an, uh, an uh, 
vision by hearing. Um, and you get the situation where something um, was so bright, even brighter than the sun, that blinded everybody, including the, the, the men who were with him. Uh, and only he can hear uh, the voice of Jesus, uh, where I think he said, Saul, Saul, why you persecute me? And he asked, uh, who's, who's speaking, uh, Lord, or something like that? And Jesus said, I am the one whom you persecuting. Um, uh, and he was blind for three days, and some guy in Damascus actually brought his vision back, uh, probably through the power of uh, the Holy Spirit. W mm. what, what do you think of this weird story? Well, there are three different tellings of it in the book of Acts, and in one of them, he um, is said to have seen the righteous one, now, does that mean that was the blast of light or that he saw a human form in it? But it says that the others saw the light but didn't hear the voice. Uh, and then in another version, it says they heard the voice but didn't see the light. Uh, and so there's, I don't think Luke was incompetent. It, it rather looks like he's varying the details just to freshen up the narrative. Uh, but uh, who who knows? Some but, apologists, uh, Bob, say uh, uh, heard does not mean necessarily understand because you can hear a noise, but the actual uh, interpretation and the words will hit true only with Paul. Everybody else would just hear noise, but not uh, not understanding what's going on. Yeah, that would be something like in John chapter 12, where uh, um, Jesus says, now the hour has come. What should I say? Uh, uh, Father, save me from this hour. No, no, that's why I came to this point. Uh, Father, glorify your name uh, in the crucifixion. He means, and a voice came from heaven and said, I have glorified it and I'm about to glorify it again. And John says, the crowd standing by heard this but some said eh, it was just thunder and others said no no it said something it was an angel speaking to him so it could have been the same sort of thing depending on whether you tuned in or not you'll hear part of the truth could be but it just strikes me as the fact that the same contrast is made in both uh, the voice, but not the uh, the the sight. Oh, it, it sounds like it's they're just flipping it around. Who knows? But that's a difficulty. But it's even more difficult that, from what we know about Jewish law, Paul could not have gotten authority from the head of the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem to go arresting and torturing people in Damascus. Uh, and dragging them back in chains. This is like a kind of medieval sort of uh, a nightmare scenario. And that would put Paul in a, in a such a rank. Like that would be a high-ranked officer to, to be on a such mission. Mm -hmm. Whereas he's just the coat check boy earlier during the uh, martyrdom of Stephen. It, uh, it, it, there, there are big problems uh, with it, and uh, there's also implied parallels with John the Baptist, since Ananias is another yeah. version of the same name, Johann Anaya. Uh, and and uh, what did John the Baptist say? Repent, make your paths straight, and it gives Ananias his address. He lives in the street called Straight. You know, uh, it makes you wonder, and. Uh, the same thing about being blinded, that happens three chapters later with Elimas, uh, the, the, the sorcerer, who's trying to get Sergius Paulus not to believe Paul. And so Paul slaps him with, with a temporary blindness. Uh, again, just like in, in Second Maccabees, uh, I, uh, it, it, maybe it all means nothing, but I, I doubt it seriously and uh so it seems to me it's all literary and going back to romans 16 since the story uh, is manifestly borrowed from well-known literary sources uh, i i'm not so sure that the idea of paul as the converted persecutor has any basis in pauline biography they yeah, may have just borrow the whole idea 
Bob, we're talking about this is a very early stage. I mean, the writings of Paul predates the, the, the four Gospels. So we're talking about a very early stage of Christianity here. Uh, is it even warrant? I mean, are, were there enough Christians and enough headache caused to the, to the Roman Empire that will actually sort of dedicate? We know from their attitude they, were even, they weren't even bothered with Jesus. They kept asking whether, you sure you want to exclude this guy? And the Jews said, yeah, yeah, he's the guy. You sure you don't want the, the thief, the, the actual horrible person to be um, uh, crucified and said, no, no, we want this guy. So why suddenly, you know, we're talking about the initial, uh, what were the numbers of Christians in your, in your mind around that era? Are we talking hundreds of thousands? Tens of thousands or thousands? Uh, well, I think the book of Acts wants us to think that there are many thousands because uh, it says that on the day of Pentecost, what was it, 3,000 believed and were baptized. And then uh, later, I think it ups it to 5,000. And then by chapter 21, when Paul comes back to Jerusalem, James says to him, behold how many myriads uh, of Jews have believed. Uh, that implies tens of thousands. Uh, but uh, that just seems highly uh, artificial. Uh, the, it's like in Buddhism, when, uh, the, when Gautama was around preaching, everybody was getting enlightened. But once you get out of... Uh, the golden age myth of the founding of a religion, you find out that uh, very few people any longer were getting enlightened. It was too difficult. So they began to say, well, don't worry, um, play your cards right, and you'll be reincarnated when Maitreya Buddha comes uh, centuries from now, and then it'll be as easy as it was in the yeah. Buddha's day. This seems like the same kind of thing, just magnifying the... And I'm the, trying to think logically, Bob, if, if you're the Roman Empire and you have headaches every other day, of a messiah, a wannabe messiah who wants to lead a revolution uh, and, 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 and a politically driven one and to be a king for a new kingdom and send the invaders packing. And suddenly they get the one messiah who says, well, my kingdom is not from this world. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and wouldn't the, the, the Romans be so... This is our favorite version of Messiah. This is the guy who's not going to cause a headache. Uh, the believers of that Messiah are least likely to, to lead a revolution against us. Uh, let them be. Why then annoy the hell out of them? Well, in fact, uh, in the book of Acts, nobody lays a hand on them until they start preaching the doctrine of resurrection with Jesus as exhibit A. And then they, they start getting uh, um, persecuted as heretics by the Sadducean establishment of the Sanhedrin. Paul is hauled in later. Uh, and uh, he says, look, I, I don't know why I'm here today. I, I, I'm just preaching our traditional doctrine of the resurrection of the dead, uh, which happened with Jesus. And he's cleverly dividing the, the court because he knows the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection, whereas the Pharisees do. And they start sticking up for him. They say, well, how do we know this guy didn't see a vision of an angel or something? I don't see why we need to bother him. And the others, start, they a brawl erupts like the Jerry Springer show. And uh, it, and and if Jesus, like the Romans apparently did not believe that Jesus was an otherworldly would-be king because they executed him. Um, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Now, the gospel writers say it was a frame up, but the Romans certainly thought that's what he was. And, and yet there's no attempt to round up the rest of the movement when they kill Jesus. And once J they start publicly preaching, the issue is, hey, shut up about this resurrection nonsense. It, it just doesn't fit together. They're like 
pushing the later Jewish versus Christian religious debate back into the earliest days of the church. It's just like at the trial of Jesus. Jesus is condemned for blasphemy, for claiming to be the Messiah. That wasn't blasphemy. Nobody said Simon Bar Kokhba was a blasphemer because he claimed to be the Messiah. He was just wrong, right? And so the whole thing looks unreliable. It just seems like uh, somebody is cobbling together a story for Christians who who are not going to look at it that. What, what about what about uh, forget about being the Messiah? And I'm going to get to a very interesting comment in a minute here by Ralph Ellis. Um, um, the uh, forget about the Messiah. How about Son of God or God? Uh, was there any reference? Well, I mean, Paul here, Paul referred to him as the Son of God. But are we talking about the uh, the the traditional Jewish understanding of a Son of God who is a pious person or the Son of God? There's no way to know. I mean, if anything, it seems to me, if you hear in a Jewish context that somebody is the son of God, it, it need mean no more than uh, they're the son of God like David and Solomon. Uh, in 1 Samuel 7, your descendants, each one will be my son and I'll be his father. And uh, Psalm number two, the investiture Psalm, I will tell of the decree of Yahweh. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. That was for every successive king. So it's not clear. And uh, And what did Jesus say about this? I was just answering this question from somebody the other day. Uh, somebody asked me, did Jesus claim to be God? And I said, well, I don't think he ever does in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But yeah, even in John, John there, there's like two places where it seems like Jesus is saying, oh, yeah, that's me. I, and not only am I God, but where he says, I and the Father are one. Uh, and then they, they take up stones to stone them and say, you're making God your own father. You're making yourself God. Uh, and uh, and then he kind of backs down from it uh, and says, hey, look, look, don't you remember in the Bible where it says to those to whom the word of God came, I said you are God's. Uh, and uh, look, that's I'm not even saying that. I'm just saying I'm the son of God. And then there's in the Last Supper where they say, show us the Father, and that'll be enough. And Jesus says, have I been with you this long and you don't recognize me yet? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And then he says, ah, uh, but of course, uh, what I mean is that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. What? Yeah, uh, and sometimes and, he refers to the, the, the father is greater than him. Yeah, like what's going on here? It, it seems to me you've got clashing redactors that, that's, that in both these cases, some, some uh, Christian copyist was saying, wait a minute, that's, that's going too far. Uh, yeah. And I, I got to have Jesus suddenly confuse the issue. So did he ever even say anything that would have been construed as blasphemy? That's not clear to me at all. Yeah. Uh, and that's one reason they think the trial narrative seems to be a later debate pushed back into it. It says, are you the Messiah? Tell us, the, tell us plainly. And uh, in Luke, he's just evasive. He said, well, if I tell you whatever I say, you, you won't believe it. So why bother? But in, in Matthew and Mark, you've got uh, a kind of an iffy, equivocal reply. He says, but I will tell you this. From now on, you'll be seeing the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power. Well, that's just Daniel 7. Is that Jesus or, or what? I mean, it's purposely evasive. So I, it seems to me that uh, people are just kind of ramming one, the later Christian debate into the passion. One quick question, Bob, before I move to Ralph Ellis's comment here, a very interesting one. Um, do the Romans have any track records of persecuting other religions other than Christianity? Were they... Um, I mean, sometimes they're portrayed as, uh, you know, just like the Greeks. They didn't care. It was freedom of religion type of thing. You, you know, you, you, you worship who you, who you please. 
uh, they were bothered. Um, uh, is that true? Or they had track record of saying, no, 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 this is the national religion of the country, of the imp uh, empire, and, and that's that's about it. You, you're not allowed to, to, to seek elsewhere. No, the closest we have to that is that it was considered a kind of bad manners for a wife to embrace one of these exotic mystery religions that were all over the place, including Judaism. Uh, and uh, look, honey, why can't you just be like me and the kids and go to the shrine of Apollo? I, I'm, you're making me nervous with this stuff with Serapis. And so Plutarch says a good wife would not worship gods her husband doesn't approve of. Uh -huh. And that was kind of widespread, but that's not legality. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the juvenile pokes fun at, at people like that. But the official approach was to welcome the, the gods aboard and to pursue syncretism and say, oh, what, uh, you got Osiris here? Well, obviously, that's another name for Dionysus. Come on in. Uh, yeah. there, there wasn't a problem. Uh, and uh, the even with the utterly weird religion of, of Attis that involves self-castration, right? Even that they didn't outlaw. Uh, and uh, they were just looked at as kind of a bunch of weirdo. So, so it was only looked down upon in, in terms of uh, uh, regarding the family as a unit. Anything that breaks the family as a unit, it was locked, you know, not nice. Don't do it, you know. But it wasn't really sort of illegal or anything. Oh, and that's the way it's approached in 1 Corinthians 7. It says if, if you are a Christian and your husband is not, don't leave him. Uh, you're, you're thinking, oh, well, I'm one of the gods chosen, and, and he's not despite how much I nag him. And he says, look, uh, let it go. Don't create strife. And if you're worried about whether your children are, are bastards because you're maybe not le uh, legitimately married in the side of God. Don't worry about that. As long as you're uh, okay with God, your kids are okay by him. Uh, but if he can't stand you being a Christian, well, all right, what the heck? Uh, then, you know, don't make trouble over it. You can even remarry as long as it's to a Christian. So, I mean, even, even uh, the Christians are taking that approach. Uh, that uh, it would it'd be better if you had har religious harmony in the family, but there's nothing about, oh, divorce him, that, that worthless yeah. thing. And Fair enough. Now, this is an interesting view here. What do you think? R Ralph Ellis reckons uh, Paul uh, uh, Saul was actually Josephus Flavius, who was the army commander in charge of the Galilee. Uh, I don't, I'm not persuaded by that, but I have to admit, uh, he's not just making it up. Uh, Ralph came up with this very impressive list of parallels between Paul in the New Testament and Josephus in his own writings. Uh, and uh, some of them are so close that you have to wonder if you've got uh New Testament writers borrowing stuff from Josephus and uh, like the idea of um, Joseph of Arimathea possibly being another rendering of Josephus bar Matthias uh, and that he gets uh, Titus to take down a friend of his alive from the cross and uh, but the other two guys crucified with him are too far gone and they die. That does sound an awful lot like an earlier version of what we're reading in the Gospels. And there's there are various other ones. So I tend to, to, to take a slightly different approach uh, to, to the data Ralph came up with and say, I suspect that what you've got here is somebody modeling the career of Paul on that of Josephus. That we we're really they didn't know anything about him either and kind of modeled him on to uh, 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 Josephus and what we can discern about him from his writings. Uh, I think that would probably satisfy the uh, the the data. my my big problem is it, it seems hard for me to imagine 
that Paul would have um, would have uh, written this huge corpus of apologetical writings on behalf of Judaism. So, Bobby, you're you're saying that Paul might be Paul or Simon or you know that independent mm -hmm. person, but in, in in to 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 serve the literature of the writing and to portray him in a certain way. They start borrowing some side stories from people, you know, whether it's Flavius, uh, Josephus Flavius, or or Simon, or some other people, to enrich the narrative of Paul, because otherwise yeah. it, would, it would have been just an ordinary man. Yeah, I, I think so. They had to uh, fill the vacuum once, just like the apocryphal. This is different, but the apocryphal infancy gospels. They had no idea, assuming Jesus was a historical figure, what could he have been doing before he was baptized by John? Well, once they had the incarnation in mind, they figured, well, he must have been divine from day one. What would he have been doing with those divine powers? Well, he was just a kid. What would a kid do with them? And so you have all these uh, perhaps unwittingly comical adventures of the kid Jesus, Jesus the menace, right? And, and uh, so they're trying to fill the vacuum and I suspect that's what they were doing with liberal borrowings from Josephus, uh, from the Bacchae, from Second Maccabees, and, and so on. Um, so, like, I, things get people get hypersensitive when you mention Ralph Ellis because he's he is so bold and has uh, his his scanners out in all directions that like he starts with the premise isn't it odd that if jesus were the big history shaking figure he's supposed to be that he would have left no footprint in secular history that that does seem weird well maybe he did leave a bunch of footprints and so he says let's look at other other characters who could conceivably have been other tellings of jesus in fact, some people just ridicule and mock that. I don't find it persuasive, but I don't think it's it's uh, it's crazy. He's pushing a paradigm as far as as he can to see how much sense it will make, and yeah. uh, that's genuinely scholarly. You don't have to agree with everything anybody says, but he is a creative theoretician and historian again i don't buy everything he says but i respect him and his work no and it makes it quite interesting because at the end of the day as you said we don't have uh time machines we're we're, we're, we're trying to sort of explain the data explain the information uh based on uh, on narratives and you will end up with some different theories but it seems to be that there is a pattern that nobody is exactly as they seem in the story uh, it, it seems a story, like any good movie or any good story, people are mostly bland and you need to spice things up. <laughs> mm. And you spice things up by borrowing some interesting bits and pieces from different people around you. So mm -hmm. if you want your character to be a warrior, then you pick a warrior who might have a completely different story, but you just take his warriorness. Uh, extract that and up uh, and copy and paste and and that's why you end up with these weird personalities that um, often contradict themselves. Um, mm -hmm. Ralph said something very interesting that I'm not aware of. Uh, he said, uh, "Remember that Saul and Josephus were on the same shipwreck on Malta while going to see Nero. Obviously, that's towards the end of uh, uh, Saul's career because this is where he gets the the, the ultimate." Um, uh, sentence but if both of them are on the same ship rick uh, uh aren't they two separate persons then that's um, um maybe bobby can enlighten me here or you could say that uh, uh well there you go uh it's uh they must have been the same guy under two different names or you could say there was only josephus but that adventure has been borrowed uh for paul 
because th there's a whole lot of similarity between the the various uh, shipwreck narratives uh, of which many appear in in ancient Hellenistic literature and the one in Acts. Uh, so uh, it, it uh, there are various ways of explaining that, but there's a great example of what I mean. Does that mean nothing, or does it mean something? And I suspect he's right to point out that it's got to yes. mean something. And I, I would adopt a different, uh, I would hazard a different guess, but he deserves credit for pointing out a lot of these things that are just invisible. Though. But you remember in, in some comic books, when you when you construct a character, sometimes you tease. Now, the, 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 where is this uh, character come from? Like we know that Superman is Jesus, you know? And mm -hmm. sometimes they're almost like deliberately giving you hints. Maybe that's a deliberate hint to say, hey, there is some commonality here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think so. Like, does it mean something or does it mean nothing? And the apologetics approach is, ah, it doesn't mean anything. And none of it means anything. It's, it's all coincidence. I, I love it. Re, just recently, I heard people say, you uh, are you like to ridicule conspiracy theories because you prefer coincidence theories. You know, I'm not sure if they're any better. Right? That's uh, that you're, it's almost another type of conspiracy theory. Oh, yeah, it's, it's all just an amazing series of coincidences. How, how far can you push that? Uh, and uh, th suddenly it becomes, like Hume said, if you want to argue that a miracle happened, you, you need to show that any non-supernatural explanation uh, is, uh, is more far-fetched. Yeah, yeah. It's quite a, thank you, Constellation Pegasus, for the super chat. Uh, and I kind of agree with him here. He's saying Paul is, is, is always drawing that kind of, you know, skepticism from uh, J Jews, atheists, as well as some Christians. We, uh, the, the, the role of Paul has been always controversial. And we're going to get into that because Paul, um, Paul's writing is very important for Christianity. Plus, there are some um, aspects of Christianity that have been attributed to Paul, such as um, chauvinism and, you know, uh, mus uh, excessive masculinities and stuff like that. We'll get into that in a second. But it was followed by another um, super chat from Constellation Pegasus. Thank you very much. Who came first, uh, the Pharisees or uh, the Sadducees? It's bizarre how God could let them coexist. Uh, well, this, the uh, and I've not heard hardly anybody comment on this, but in a uh, a little book of his, T. W. Manson, a uh, book called The Servant Messiah, has a little historical sketch of the background of the public ministry of Jesus. That's really what the book's about. And he says, who were these guys? Who were the Sadducees and the Pharisees? And he says, well, though the Sadducees called themselves the Zadokites, and, and it's a possible uh, alternate spelling, meaning the Zadokite priests that David supposedly installed. Uh, and uh, because the Sadducees were priestly aristocrats, he says, I'm not so sure about that. I think it's simpler that Sadducee is uh, another version of the Greek syndikoi, members of a syndicate or council because that's what they were they were the wealthy leaders or elders of the people but the pharisees uh they later said that their their name came from the parushim the separated ones it would be equivalent to the puritans right they had the same idea but uh he didn't think that they uh that these that name originally had that connotation either he said have you ever noticed how judaism after the exile of the Babylonian then Persian exile, uh, after uh, Cyrus allowed Jewish leaders to go back to Jerusalem and commission them to rebuild the temple, etc., how Judaism is very different 
you've got the idea of an evil anti-God. Satan was a servant of God, a, a, a kind of a district attorney in the Old Testament once or twice, but, but he becomes the evil opponent of God after the exile. Uh, you, you had uh, messengers of God in Genesis, but you've got a fantastic system of angels afterward. The Essenes, the Pharisees, where'd this come from? Well, you know, they had it in, in Persian Zoroastrianism, uh, the periodization of history, that it's all happening according to this big timeline. The idea of a, of a supernatural Messiah who would be born of a virgin and who would raise the dead for the final judgment. Where did you ever find this stuff in, in the Old Testament? He says, well, it all came from Zoroastrianism, which kind of means that uh, the people like Ezra, who were Jews, but, uh, ad but uh, members of the Persian administration, what they did when they brought back um, the Jewish leadership was to impose a kind of Jewish Zoroastrianism. Uh, and that would sure make sense of the radical difference in why the Pharisees and the Sadducees were utterly opposed. And uh, in fact, he's, he, uh, Manson says that that's what Pharisee meant, that the Sadducees hearing this new fangled stuff said, wait a minute, you're not really Jews. You're, you're Zoroastrians, you're Parsees. Persians and Pharisees simply means Parsis, which is what they're called today in India. I, I, I find that absolutely convincing. And, and so it's amazing. They're like, what is it, Jacob and Esau struggling within the womb. It's almost two different religions uh, coexisting not so happily. Well, you still get that today. I mean, like you look at Islam and you look at Sunni Muslim and Shia Muslim, they yeah. probably look at each other as separate, even though they have come from the same sort of idea, but they mm -hmm. diverged so far that they almost become two separate religions at this point. And they, you know, they kill each other, you know, um, yeah. to, to date. Ralph make, makes an interesting point here. Um, and, and, and talks about, and, and, and I kind of understand that. And I even, I dare to agree that uh, I'm not talking about this particular incident. Here's a, the main problem with Saul Josephus' correlation is that the gospel events must have taken place in the 8060s. That is a problem that many people cannot cross. There are theories that antiquity and ancient history, especially in the religious texts, to justify um, miracles and prophecies. Uh, that things are written way after the event, most of the time. And therefore, a lot of prophecies are <laughs> floating around because it's already happened. So yeah. you backdate the text to say, oh, see, I, I prophesied that it was going to happen. And um, so there's a lot, not just, you know, a, a theological text, but there is a lot of that in the ancient history. There is even a theory that sometimes a certain period would go completely missing from the text book because maybe a certain civilization want to hide their, their tracks or maybe some um, horrible defeats and they end up sort of uh, scrapping it from the, the history. There's a lot of manipulation going on. Uh, and I think that might be uh, true to some extent. What do you think of that about? Yeah, like just look at um, Lena Einhorn, who does not have a horse in this race. Um, she nonetheless comes up with a uh, with it in this respect a similar theory that the the events of uh, Jesus and Paul sound so much like things that are documented in Josephus and elsewhere as having happened forty years later that uh, she suspects it's there's been intentional reshuffling of the deck partly for Christian apologetic reasons uh, to make it look less like that uh, there were really re Jewish revolutionary implications as to what Jesus was doing, that maybe Jesus uh, was the Egyptian that Josephus talks about and uh, that Paul, or that, well, she actually goes so far as to say that Jesus, Paul, the Egyptian 
Theudas and others were all reflections of the same guy, which is kind of like uh, what, uh, on a larger scale, Ralph is suggesting. It, it's like the the historic. I mean, you know, the the official order of events cannot be infallible and sacrosanct if only because of the problem of John the Baptist, uh, his death being associated with. King Aretas IV's defeat of Herod Antipas, which should have happened uh, closer to the, the time of, uh, uh, well, before the death of Jesus, according to the gospel reckoning. But, uh, it, uh, but it winds up with John being put to death years after Jesus. What's going on? Uh, it, it's not, or there's a big debate over when Pontius Pilate uh, took office. Uh, and I, I, was it 20 years earlier than the Gospels imply? It's not all that wrapped up. And then when you think about how there were different theories as to when Jesus lived, right? There were Jews and some Christians who thought Jesus lived uh, about 100 years BCE. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, and Irenaeus, Mister Reliable, Mister uh, you know Orthodoxy, said that Jesus must have been nearly fifty when he died in the reign of Claudius. What you, you can't remember even when the guy lived? Uh, the, in Buddhism, they had the same problem. There's a huge or Zoroastrianism. My gosh, they've got like a thousand year range as to when Zoroaster might have been born. So yeah. these things are not as uh, as cut and dried as they seem sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just thinking here. You're pushing in a narrative. You're writing basically a, a novel. And you want your novel to be dramatic, and you, you got these characters, and they're going to be appealing, and they're going to be convinced, not not really convincing, because people uh, persuasion was slightly different, and I can more like um, motivated by these characters, and 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 we're talking about pre-logical societies. We're talking about societies that probably moved by uh, stories of heroism and and might and miracles and and magic. That's what used to move the masses, and therefore the stories are filled with that, with these sort of characters that you know that, that defy gravity and defy logic. Um, mm. uh, so I can completely understand uh, why is the writing uh, uh, absence, obviously, of any recording mechanism today. I mean, even today, you know, you get people um, uh, will actually <laughs> tell uh, certain stories and will be right in front of you, like Alex Jones now has been persecuted. He's going to have to cough um, $5.4 million for, um, you know, uh, talking about uh, conspiracy theories and uh, the massacre didn't happen and the, the poor uh, family of the, that child sort of suffered because of it. And uh, But it's happening today. And he's got a lot of followers. Mm. Uh, in today's world where things can be documented there are videos there are recording and people are still gullible and you know i don't think it's going to go away any soon mm. uh sorry before before you uh tackled that bob uh the dusty dot uh, asked the question he said were you guys uh, still going to do a show about the origin of satan and the angels and the canaanites origins thanks yes when I come back from holiday, I'm going to be guys away for five weeks going to Europe um, in a couple of days. But definitely this is going to be an episode between uh, Bob and uh, myself. Yeah, I love that topic. Oh, Satan is, is fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I think he's made up of people. <laughs> yes, that's right. He's the combination of uh, Beelzebul, Leviathan, uh, and... Uh, oh. Uh, Ahriman and so forth. Yeah, the, the the evolution of characters is fascinating to track the 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 when the, the the first seed of an idea and when it branches to become a tree and all the additions over the years uh, on, on on the on Satan to end up becoming like the uh, the symbol of, of evil and and uh, a lot of people were used to justify the problem of evil. Uh, in theodicies, which is, but the poor guy started. He had a very humble beginning to the point where he was God's uh, right hand at some point. 
Yeah, yeah, God's special prosecutor. Yeah. Um, so we, 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 what? So I mean, going back to Paul. Uh, now we've, we've advanced in the, sto the story a bit. He, he converted to Christianity, and now he's advocating uh, that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Son of God, but he does certain things that might upset other people from him, unlike the disciples who you would to receive the revelation quite ambiguously from, from Jesus and they're not quite sure what's going on. Paul receives one clear or few clear messages directly from the source. His gospel is no like no other gospel. He taps directly into the source. That is a large claim for Paul to make. Mm. Yeah, it's funny that this reminds me of something Walter Kaufman said in his great book, The Faith of a Heretic. He says that um, those who advise us to put reason on the shelf and make a, a leap of faith uh, don't seem to realize that that's not the only leap in town, uh, that there's all kinds of sectarian cult groups and so on who are making the same pitch uh, don't hear, don't, don't give in to the conflicting barking of uh, human opinion. Uh, we've got the voice from beyond. We've got the revelation from God. And to access it, you just have to have faith. Well, I, I could do that, but that's like a shot in the dark, isn't it? I mean, they're all saying that. I could wind up in the, the people's temple. Uh, or the Manson family just as easily as uh, going forward in a Billy Graham crusade. Like, how can you uh, how can you just throw out reason? It may be a poor tool, but it may be the only one you've got. And uh, so uh, you can see the uh, viewpoint of Peter in the pseudo Clementines when he's saying. You say you got a revelation from Jesus. Who knows where that came from? Uh, and uh, that's uh, and and what did Paul say? That I, I love this in Galatians. He says, uh, "I didn't receive my gospel from any human source. I got it directly from Christ." And if anybody comes to you with another gospel than the one I preach, even if it's an angel from heaven. Don't believe him. Oh, wait a minute. Isn't that kind of where Paul says he got his gospel, a direct revelation from heaven? Why should you believe him and not the angel Moroni appearing to Joseph Smith? What's the difference? It's all subjective arbitrariness. Uh, uh, slightly off topic, uh, but Constellation Pegasus is, a, is such a gentleman. And thank you again for the super chat. Uh, is it Satan or the Satan in the Hebrew scriptures? Uh, a title? That's a question mark. Um, so I uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Is it in Hebrew? Hasatan? Uh, yes. The Satan, uh, the, the accuser? Uh, the adversary? Yeah, it could be either one. But apparently um, in the uh, context of the three Old Testament references, there's no reason to... Uh, take it as a name like in in the greek new testament it's the jesus the paul or they just had definite articles for proper names so you have to determine whether uh if you can what the context implies and in um uh in all three of the uh the old testament references it, he is presented as the as the, the uh, guy in charge of sting operations for God, or um, the uh, the district attorney saying, well, wait a minute, you're considering this guy for high priest? I think you need to look at his resume again. His his uh, linen garment is stained here, and uh, or, or uh, uh, David. Uh, he, he supposedly trusts you. Let's, uh, let's, uh, whisper to him, you know, you, you might as well, before you go into battle, 
at least take a census of how many men you've got. Uh, because if he does, that means he doesn't trust you. And Job, right? Have you considered Job? being used my favorite. He says, yeah, right. Uh, yeah, well, let's do a little experiment here. I mean, since that's all he does in all those places, it's, it's uh, sticking with the evidence to say it means the adversary, since that's what Satan means, uh, and the adversary in a legal sense. Uh, but in the New Testament, um, many times you'd be, you'd be just as um, uh, justified to to render it as the Satan, uh, just like when you say the devil, which means the same thing. Uh, it's just based on Greek diabolos. Well, Bob, there is something here. A lot of people think the snake in the garden, the serpent in the garden of Eden, is Satan, but it's not actually that straightforward. It's, no, it's, it doesn't it's, say that until you get to uh, the life of Adam and Eve and Second Enoch and later yeah. books like this. And even there, they draw a distinction and say that the Satan possessed the serpent, uh, which is why uh, the serpent is more subtle or wise than any creature God has made, because it isn't just him. Uh, yeah. He's being uh, used. And they call him the shiny one, I think, and it's reference to the morning star. Uh, yeah, the... the uh, the seraphim are the blazing or shining ones, which can just mean poisonous snakes, as when uh, God sends the the uh, the uh, blazing ones and to bite the people because he's sick of their griping, and then uh, to uh, save them on second thought, he has Moses build the caduceus and so on. Well, but but in Isaiah. The, the seraphim uh, seem to be the same as in Egyptian iconography, where they are blazing serpents, which uh, who are winged and uh, may have limbs as they need them to perform the chores God assigns them. They may have hands and feet if they need them. And uh, th that is, those are the ones that appear in Isaiah 6. They're winged and they have hands and feet uh, and they use the hands to pick up tongs from the altar and, which, uh, the, which will make the curse of god uh for the serpent to always crawl on his belly a lot more logical then because it then it it says well you, you actually have more than because a lot of, you know ricky gervais said that so what the hell uh, god condemning the serpent to 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 crawl on its belly even though it was doing that anyway, you know, like it was, it's not really no, it a punishment. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. It's like he stripped the limbs off it. Implicitly, it must have had wings or limbs and uh, that, but not anymore. Uh, and so that, that's right. The, the ancients understood this because the symbols were common. We have to reconstruct them by all these cross cross references but once you do it forms a pretty coherent picture and uh and so that uh you know it's not that stupid i mean th there are some dumb goofs in the bible but that that's why in my book um when gospels collide i'm actually a kind of apologist i take all of the just limiting it to the gospels all these contradictions and so on and i say were these gospel writers just a bunch of idiots they didn't proofread anything no no they're, they're creative and ingenious storytellers who create who varied the story to make pretty obvious points uh and so perhaps like don dominic cross and says we're the stupid ones. Sometimes and you know, you, you know, Bob, I hate to say that, but you know, you, we got to be honest. Even scientifically in evolution, uh, snakes used to have legs before they lost them about 70 million years ago. They're, they're still vestigial. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there, there's some reference to that. So there, there is, I mean, I mean, pe people hate on uh, sacred text, but there is a bit of, there's a bit going on there it's not completely dumb as people might think <laughs> yeah because even like if i don't know which snakes had them or not uh but i know some did so if the snakes. ancients could see that 
then this is one of those instances where they're using the their ingenuity to figure out what happened here. It's like the rainbow. Is that stupid? No, they couldn't have known about light refraction. So what they came up with was sounded pretty good as a theory. Now we know better. But it wasn't stupidity. It was imagination. Well, Constellation Pickers is is is, is very generous today. Thank you so much. Mm. Uh, he's obviously uh, loving the, and we're going to, to uh, promise you folks, we got, we're going to do a full episode on Satan. I'm, I'm very interested, the evolution, um, you know, of Satan and uh, the origin of Satan. So we, we're going to do that for sure. Another thing about the serpent in Eden, if it was not Satan, then God punished an entire species because of one screwing up. Not fair to me on that. Maybe the serpent was all alone and no others like him. Well, that begs the question. It's it's exactly you can infer the thing about Adam and Eve because of of a couple's mistake or misjudgment. We're all being judged, <laughs> not just the, the the offspring of the spring of the serpent, but the offsprings of uh, of all humanity. Yeah, sometimes Old Testament scholars call this corporate personality. Uh, so that uh, the die is cast way back there and you have your ancestor to thank for it. Uh, like, would we have all the racial problems we have if it wasn't for these idiots that uh, practiced the slave trade? Uh, we Like it or not, we've inherited uh, the horrific implications of this mistake our ancestors, oh, mistake, that's a euphemism, uh, that, that our ancestors did. History, I think that this idea that where God uh, visits the iniquity upon the third and fourth generations, mm -hmm. uh, that's just a kind of sober pessimism. You can't just change the past. You're going to have to live with what your ancestors did. Uh, I mean, maybe you can change it, but if not, you have them to thank. God's not going to just intervene and correct everything. Uh, why he doesn't, who knows, but don't kid yourself, it's not going to happen. And uh, especially with the snake, of course, this is an ancient mythical kind of thinking. You're trying to think of some one thing that might have caused things to be as they are. Gee, that's odd. Snakes appear to have had legs, but they don't anymore. What, what could have led to that? And so you think naturally of some particular event. Uh, and and it's, it's myth. Uh, but it's it, you can't really hold these ancients responsible for not having scientific method. Give them time. They made amazing progress uh, amazingly quickly in the scheme of things. But here you just have to admire the imagination. And uh, that's all they could do at the time. Yeah, no, fair play. I, th I think that's the case. And I think uh, that's our human endeavor. It's not infallible, but... Uh, to completely dismiss it. That's why I think people who dismiss uh, the uh, old scripture for being completely crack pottery and, you know, that's, you know, we, we will do uh, very good to completely ignore them and focus on science. Uh, I would actually say, yeah, you can still focus on science, but you need to understand your humble beginnings because mm -hmm. everything that is written there, even though it might have not come from God or from, from heavens, but surely it's written by us. And it reflects our psychological state of mind back then. We yeah. need to understand where we come from to know where we're going. Yeah, I, the, the Bible hatred. I, I wrote an article once called, Is the Bible Mein Kampf? And uh, I said that some people seem to think it is, it isn't. But uh, why all the taking delight in, in the errors uh, and uh, blemishes the Bible? Uh, Ingersoll put it perfectly. He said it's not a question of hating the Bible. It's just trying to take the weapon out of the hand of a fanatic. Uh, if the belief that the Bible is divinely inspired and, and infallible has made it a handy tool of oppression, uh, and, and that shouldn't be the case. So it's painful to do it if you love the Bible as a piece of literature, but you have to point out the holes in it. It's not what you think it is. It's not something that gives you the right to order people around. 
Uh, once you get that straight, you're free to like the Bible for what's likable about it. Very good. I mean, we're, um, do you, do you, I mean, maybe we can skip to the um, advance in, in Paul's uh, career. <laughs> and uh, obviously, he, um, uh, one of the, the, the couple of things about his importance, uh, do you really think that his writings predate the gospel? Uh, hard to tell because I think that the Gospels are uh, second century, but likely the epistles of Paul are too. Uh, and not that you have to reshuffle the date of Paul. I mean, who knows uh, wh when he would have lived or Simon would have lived. But the texts have various signs just as the gospels do of belonging to a later period and so the relative dating i don't know if that can ever be settled but it it's almost a moot point because what you can do is to look carefully at the contents of both groups and say does this seem to presuppose an earlier version than this does you know how um mythicists often say, well, look, there's, there's no real historical Jesus in the epistles. Where is Jesus the miracle worker, Jesus the itinerant rabbi, uh, and so on and so forth? There's none of that. But the Gospels are filled with it, so presumably the Gospels uh, show later embellishment. Well, that's true, but the thing is, different things are written in different places at different times and all you can really say is i think that logically it does appear that the epistles attest a simpler probably earlier version of christian faith that did not picture a historical individual named jesus uh, and uh, the gospels stem from some time when this had all been filled in and Jesus had been made the object of legends, but that could have hung on for, I mean, the, the, uh, the um, more mythic version, no doubt, hung on longer in some places than others. So who knows when they were actually written, but you can try to discern earlier versus later versions of the faith. That implies a hypothesis of an evolutionary timeline. Uh, but I think that's that can be reasonably done. Uh, some critics and uh, some people view that Paul's um, message were focused around the, the the message of Jesus, what Jesus is about, uh, and what he's trying to convey. Uh, but then the Gospels came along, and the focus shifted from the message to the actual person. He became the center the epicenter of the attention. Through Jesus, everything is possible, rather than what would Jesus do sort of thing. Do you think that this is this is a fair assessment? I'd almost put it the other way around, uh, because in the Gospel of John and the epistles, there's very little uh, having to do with teaching attributable to Jesus. As, as uh, Bultmann said about the Gospel of John, in John, Jesus reveals that he is the revealer. That's mm. the content of the revelation. Uh, there's a little bit of stuff that he says here and there, but in debate with the Pharisees, but really his point is that he is the revealer. Well, the revealer of what? Of the fact that he is the revealer. Uh, whereas in the Gospels, as, as uh, Harnack said, uh, the gospel is all about the Father, not about the Son. Uh, Jesus, e even the atonement of Jesus is not as predominant in the go synoptic gospels as uh, preachers would have you believe. That really comes up in the epistles, where Jesus is more like a mystery cult deity. You have to become in Christ and be filled with the Spirit uh, and that you do through baptism, it seems to me, and which makes you one with Christ so that you'll rise on the last day. To me, that has little to do with the Sermon on the Mount or how to live your life. It does say you, you now can be moral and you should be, but that's what Mithraism said too. Uh, it uh, sort of assumed you knew what the right thing to do was. 
Uh, and uh, I, so I see them as very different. The life of Jesus approach makes Jesus the teacher, and he's almost secondary to it, whereas it's Jesus all the time. Uh, one last little thing about that. Uh, why uh, do we never, why is it that in the epistles, Christos is never anything but a proper name? Why, despite N.T. Wright and, and all these people that have translated as Jesus the Messiah, that's, I think that's anti-contextual. There's one single place in Romans where Ho Christos might imply the Messiah, but in, in all of the other places, it, it simply is a synonym for Jesus. Now, how could that be? Well, it's no surprise that these uh, works are written not to Jews mainly. Uh, for them, Mithras and Christos and so on were all sort of equivalent, uh, and uh, they didn't care who was the uh, the true king of this postage stamp country. They probably couldn't even identify on a map. Uh, oh boy, the the true prince of Liechtenstein has been enthroned. I don't care. You know, my, my, my opinion on this, and, and, and sometimes there is a brand that takes over a certain line of production that becomes the name of the brand. Like, for example, uh, Coke. Um, uh, uh, you know, you have Pepsi and you have Dr. Pepper. You've, you've got different type of different colas. But then colas become something, nothing. That's the actual thing that's the bloody thing is made of. And Coke being the brand, the most successful brand, Become synonymous with the product itself, and therefore, the, even like we talked about Satan, it's a title, but it became a name because he was the only one who could do that, and he's you know he's the one who would do it perfectly, and therefore the title becomes the name. Mm -hmm. Oh well, that's yeah. I don't have any problem with that, uh, though I do think there are other possibilities for what Christos denoted originally but leaving that aside yeah it's just that uh, there all one would need to say is that uh, in preaching among the gentiles the possibly original denotation of christos was lost it became moot because what did uh, greeks and romans and scythians what did they care about uh, the uh, theocratic lineage of of somebody else's country but yeah. if this guy turned out to be a dying and rising, atoning savior, well, now that's a bit different. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is an interesting one. This is to do with the actual um, verification of, of whether Paul had actually seen Jesus at any point before the resurrection or knew any of his disciples or knew. And I know there is a reference about his, the, the brother of the Lord, James. So maybe tell us a, a bit about that. Did, did, did Paul know any? of uh, Jesus' acquaintances or Jesus himself? Uh, well, I've never heard anybody refute Morton Smith, who once said uh, that when in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, if once we knew Christ, kata sarga, according to the flesh, we know him in this way no longer. So uh, is he just trying to say, those who did know the historical Jesus have no real advantage any longer. It's moot. Uh, that's what most people think, and I wouldn't be surprised. But Smith said there's no reason not to take that uh, to, to mean that Paul is saying he did once know Jesus according to the flesh, but now that's over because he's in heaven or back in heaven. So I've never been able to forget that, that he, it could well be that Paul supposedly had met Jesus. Yeah. But it's you know, really this, is, this, is a, thing. this is used as an angle for Jesus, mystic, uh, you know, uh, mythicism, because if Paul, if we agree that Paul is historical and he's seen Jesus or he's seen people who knew Jesus, then Jesus most likely have existed. You know, that's a, sort of a, another angle. It's like a, a cross verification sort of thing. Yeah, and there the problem is that uh, 
Paul does not say he met the 12. In fact, the 12 occurs only in that list of resurrection appearances in 1 Corinthians 15, which I think is an interpolated text anyway. Uh, but he speaks of the pillars, James, yeah. Cephas, and John. Who were they? Uh, there's ambiguity as to who James is supposed to be. Uh, is he Tradition says he was James the Just, who was the one the James mentioned in Mark um, six, I think. The uh, the among the the brethren are not his brothers here among us, and so on. But uh, this is a pretty common name, and though I don't buy Richard Carrier's argument that when he says the Lord's brother, he just means a, a Christian, a fellow Christian. I think that that really. It's implausible because why would he single him out? Uh, and uh, but I think G. A. Wells is probably correct when he said that there's evidence uh, in uh, Matthew 25 and uh, Third John that the brethren of the Lord were a particular missionary group. The brethren have gone out carrying the name and we ought to support them and uh, the least of these my brethren when they were in town you didn't help them it, it seems to be I think Wells was right that this had to do with a group of missionaries uh, because the 12 apparently were not missionaries to the to the nations uh, the uh, the earliest statement about them was that they will sit on 12 thrones governing the tribes of Israel Israel. Paul was the the apostle singular to the Gentiles. Well, um, so the the uh, the idea of well, so when there were other missionaries to help bear the load, they weren't the twelve. Uh, and so, if they were the brethren of the Lord, as anticipated in Third John and Matthew twenty five, we're talking about the leader of that group as in the Gospel of Thomas. We know that you will leave us, to whom should we go? Well, wherever you're coming from, you must report to James the Just. Uh, and so I, I think that uh, though Bart Ehrman may ridicule me for it, as, as he has fun doing, uh, I think Wells was probably correct and that this is not a reference to the blood brother of Jesus. Actually, I, I meant to ask you, I've had a conversation with Bart Ehrman on the channel before, and I've watched several times your debate with him by uh, moderated by Matt Delahunty at the time uh, I, and I thought it was it was very good it was a very good debate it was very respectable but what was the 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 the, the, the scene you know the meeting with Bart how, how was the dealing with him uh, maybe give us a bit of a hint well I uh think of him as a friend and I respect his work and, and there are certain books of his I recommend all the time. Uh, I think he's a, a great scholar, uh, but he, I think he is uh, he's coming at general New Testament scholarship from the restricted province of textual criticism. And though he knows an awful lot about other stuff, there are certain things that surprise me that he does not know, and that if he did, uh, he wouldn't be so severe uh, about the uh, uh, my uh, and other mythicist case. For instance, he actually burst out laughing at the idea that uh, Galatians might not have written by, been written by Paul as if you know only a lunatic would say this well this is an old and venerable theory uh rudolf steck carl bart's uh, dissertation advisor believed this there were many scholars that that believed it but uh it's news to bart or the idea that there were these uh hellenistic novels that involved premature burials empty tombs escaped crucifixions so there were no such novels yes they were and i can tell you the book to go look in to find collected translations yeah. and there were there are a number of things where i think he's jumping the gun and and doesn't know about certain things and it's not because he is ill-informed it's part of his membership in in the consensus uh, magisterium. Nobody else takes this stuff seriously, so it's not 
current coin among the Fair guilds. Yeah. And, and yeah. I, so he's a brilliant man and, and has written some great, great stuff. And I like him personally. He's a funny guy. Yes. But uh, I uh, chafed a bit at some of the stuff he said in the debate that I think was ill-informed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think he knows about these things, but he belittles them. I, I think it's like he does know uh, about all these fringe theories but you're right, he's a mainstream scholar and he wants us to remain and be defined within that mainstream uh, while the older sort of the, 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 the fringe thinkers or people who come up with different theories to, to explain different things uh, might not be mainstream, but we're not talking about empirical sciences here. We're talking about, we're trying to go back and stitch the evidence together and uh, put the the pieces of the puzzle back together so we would, might understand the context of what happened then. So mm -hmm. I don't think anybody can say with 100% certainty that is exactly what happened. <laughs> yeah. I'm the last one to think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Ray is saying Yaakov is, is the Aramaic for James. For some reason, I thought Yaakov is, is, is Jacob, not James. The same thing. James is either... is. Uh, even further removed, but it is uh, uh, another so, version of it. Of Jacob. Okay, interesting. Okay. okay. Well, and I can tell you what, the Irish uh, Seamus is James. <laughs> really? Wow. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Actually, Diago, I'll tell you what. Diego are both James. Yes. Interesting. In Irish, in Celtic, you, 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 you replace the letter J with SH or the, the sound SH. So John is Sean. You know, uh, uh, Janet is Sinead, like Sinead O'Connor, the singer. So that's how you go. Uh, you go how there. did I miss that? That makes so much <laughs> sense. Wow. It's, it's, I find, I find in languages and the variation of it, it's fascinating. Oh, yeah. Oh, fascinating. I love that stuff. Yeah. So let's skip to polls now. I mean, this is now, a, we're now, Paul is a guy who so uh, pious, he is convinced of the, the message of Christ to the point, because this is another, another area where the gospel is going to try to make a point where uh, if it's not true, why would people die for an idea? I mean, that's, again, building up the character and you build up the, the martyr, the, you know, he's a martyr. He died for what he believes. So therefore, what he believed must be true. Uh, and you get that the different variations of his um, uh, ending. Uh, some are kind of subtle, like he, he, were, he was martyred with no information whatsoever. Just that's that. Done. Uh, Finn, end of the story. And some very exaggerated ones, the, the ones you talked about, and I uh, talked about the fountain, his head bouncing three times to create the three headed fountains. <laughs> I mean, it's three almost heads time. in the fountain. <laughs> so, do you think, what do you think now about this ending? Do you, do you think it again, it's, it functions as um, the propaganda of preaching uh, the good news? Well, of uh, the apologists saying that the resurrection must have happened because the apostles would not have died for a lie. That is the, forgive me, but the stupidest argument uh, for the resurrection. Nobody says they were lying. They said, well, gee, I guess this is, I, I really stepped in at this time. Uh, I get too late to get out of it now. No, of course, anybody dies for what they believe to be true. The question is, are they right? Nobody really thinks that they're just a bunch of hoaxers. Uh, and so that uh, they said, uh, I see you're a Christian, right? You you, you want to stick with that? They said, well, no, actually, I, I was just kidding. But those, those, some people did that. Uh, but the question was... Uh, are you a member of this outlaw sect? Because uh, if you are, you know what has to happen next. And then you could back down and say, no, nah, I, I was wrong that it was uh, a big well, but We know Peter, Peter has done it three times. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, that is so fascinating that according to uh, 
uh, what the same gospel tells us, this guy just bought himself a one-way ticket to the inferno. Uh, how, how does he come back from that? Uh, and uh, so the, but the thing is, we don't know how the apostles died. They're all made martyrs, but look at the stories. Uh, that because there are stories for each one of them that are all obvious nonsense. Uh, that I think Tertullian tells us that uh, John, uh, son of Zebedee, was boiled in oil, but it uh, he came out of it smelling like a rose, so that didn't even kill him. Um, we're told that uh, that that Paul was beheaded, but he bounced back and ascended into heaven, literally bounced back. We're told that uh, St. Uh, Andrew the Apostle was crucified on an X-shaped uh, cross, uh, that Peter was crucified upside down. And why were these guys crucified? Why did they get into trouble? Uh, oddly enough, because they preached celibacy. Uh, they were telling uh, Christian women, you got to cut out the sex stuff. I don't care if you're married uh, and you lock the door on your husband. And in apocryphal acts after apocryphal acts, uh, the enraged husbands go to the governor, the king, whoever is, and say, look, you got to do something about this guy. He's alienating wives from their husbands. He's a home record. He's probably screwing these women anyway. And they say, okay, I'll do it. And so Herod Antipas, Pontius Pilate, whoever it happens to be, has, has the apostle locked up and eventually martyred because of this, the celibacy gospel. Now, you don't hear about that, that they died for celibacy, uh, but they, they, according to these utterly unreliable stories, they did. Like, they may have died uh, of, of peacefully uh, in bed uh, in, by old age. We don't know. All these stories are, are transparently fictional. So who knows what the heck happened? Yeah. So, so somebody died out of old age and they happened to be Christian. They go, oh, he, he died because of his Christianity. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that is funny. Uh, so you reckon then the story of, uh, uh, you know, the, the decapitation, uh, because apparently I, I, I was looking up his um, uh, page uh, and all the information on Paul. Uh, have you heard about uh, finding his tomb and the Vatican, you know, declaring that this is St. Paul's tomb with his name yeah, on it? it? It doesn't take much for them. To, it's like pin the tail on the Bible. Uh, well, there should be. Paul was in tomb. Here's a tomb. I bet it was Paul's. Get out of here. It's just absurd. The same thinking, if you want to call it that, has led to the discovery of like four different skulls of John the Baptist, and uh, uh, it's just ridiculous. And it says it was dated by the Vatican scientists. (laughs) Yeah, boy. Yeah, I bet that was... Not biased at all. (laughs) Yeah, they cheat on archaeology, too. Uh, It's, uh, they just, it's like the, even Albright, the Presbyterian, did this. He said, well, now the Bible's got to be right. And if it says Solomon had stables and we found some stables, ah, okay, it's Solomon's stables. What what was his name on them? Uh, It's just so ridiculous. People want to, uh, to, the faith isn't enough for them. And and that's a wise instinct, but they claim it is. And then they start pulling stunts like this. Yeah. And, and as long as you have gullible people, I mean, I still have people coming to my channels uh, uh, using the Shroud of Turin as mm. solid evidence for an existence of Jesus and historicity and that the fact he was crucified and he was gone. Uh, and, you know, and they believe, well, they, you know, it's been carbon dating and it belongs, you know, and, oh, and a DNA test. <laughs> This was a great, I mean, how how do you know? You don't have the original DNA of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. um, uh, John Baberslaw is a great uh, skeptic. Uh, He started a book on the Gospels. He he never finished. But he said that, you know, what everybody takes for granted, they all start saying textually, 
uh, there's no real doubt that in 98% that the, the, our New Testament text is, uh, is like 98% accurate. And what is still up in the air is, is just negligible moot stuff and a misspelling of a word or something like that. Uh, and, but it, yeah, we can be sure it's the, uh, it conforms to the original and Baber's law said, uh, do we have the original to check it against? So if if uh, if you tell me that uh, that you've got a uh, hundred pictures of your aunt Maisie, uh, but she is not available for for comparison, how the heck could I know they're accurate? I mean, oh, the great likeness of of what? I mean, is she here? Can we check? Uh, it's just circularity, and uh, it's amazing. People are so eager to believe it doesn't take much to convince them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Dusty Dodd is asking whether we'd be interested in doing a, a, an episode on the pagan origins of Judaism. That is very interesting to me, and I, I oh, yeah. offer that this because that's the, I think this is the mother of all stories because you know you track it to that bit. You might uh, reveal some uh, interesting understanding of Judaism, and therefore uh, God the Father, um, uh, and then His probably Son at, at some point. Mm. Uh, so, what do you think really happened? I mean, this is going to be probably the the last bit, and we're going to close here. What really happened to Paul? What what is most likely to have happened to Paul if he existed? Oh, I don't know if there's sufficient evidence to say. Uh, he, uh, given, the, I, I see that if it, if you go with the stories of Paul, he was killed, but not really, and uh, rose and ascended from heaven. And of course, no apologist wants to go that far. They cut it short, no pun intended, with his being beheaded. Uh, and because at least uh, first Clement, whoever wrote that, uh, said that uh, that he was he gave the extreme witness. He doesn't really say beheaded, but if you assume that Paul really was a Roman citizen, then okay, they would have beheaded him. Uh, but it's all iffy. It's based on unreliable tradition. With Simon, uh, of course, the the um, the the story about him is that he faked flying through the air with some sort of deus ex machina contraption some special effects thing uh, and uh that he that, that peter prayed that god would cause him to crash nice guy uh and that he did and uh was severely wounded and sort of limped away from it and died of his wound shortly afterward but that's a lot of nonsense too uh, who the heck knows is just no way to know they could i mean it, suppose there paul was a character like he's depicted in acts he could have gone uh, beyond the Roman frontier and nobody would have heard of him again. We, we, anything's possible. Yeah. I, I've always, um, you know, said quantum mechanics and um, an extreme difficult physics is a lot easier than history. Huh. Mm. History is such a, such a maze. It's, it's, you, you're trying to, not just to find out what happened. You're trying to find out what people were thinking when they were doing what they were doing and what were the motivations and what were the real outcomes. This is this is just, you know, it's almost like imp it's an impossible task almost because mm -hmm. if, if you end up with even getting the act right, uh, void of its motivation, you don't have, you still don't have the, the real picture. You know, you could, you could, Dustin Hoffman in one of his movies, I think it's called Accidental Hero. Uh, he uh, saved a person from a, a crash of, because he was accidentally looking for his shoe. <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> but you know, he, he got that was the, that's a brilliant movie by Dustin Hoffman, and people had him in like in media, it's like he's our new hero, and the guy was just <laughs> looking for his shoe. So if you don't understand the background and the motivation of the whole thing is distorted. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, well, like I think I mentioned a minute ago, uh, 
Would you glorify the martyrdom of Paul if you knew that the acts of Paul were correct and that it was his preaching of celibacy that uh, that did him in? Uh, I'm not sure. It would look a little different uh, if you thought that was uh, the case. Uh, who knows? Well, uh, consolation pickers. Uh, I mean, I can't. Uh, I mean, this is a very, very generous uh, super chat. Thank you so much. You are uh, such a valuable member of our of our endeavor to uh, to to uh, uh, reveal the truth. But mm. he's asking a question about: Have you two read any Thomas Sowell books? Which I haven't. He blows the lid off North American slavery, real history forgotten and not taught to people today. It reminds me of Christianity. No search in religion. Um, the, uh, do they uh, can't survive on false narrative? Um, yeah, that's right. Uh, the uh, the noble lie, uh, as uh, Plato called it, the useful lie. Like I cringe whenever I hear uh, theologians say, "Well, we need to come up with a usable past." So let's make Paul sound like a feminist, because that way we can get the the pew potatoes to vote our way. See, Paul wanted you to. Uh, I I so hate history as propaganda. And no. I've not read anything but quotes from Saul, but unbelievably brilliant. Yeah, it's 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 it, we've, we've we've been doing this successfully for millennia now. We we took a story, uh, we took it out of context, and we applied the context we want to apply to suit a certain narrative. We do this to date. Uh, there's a, another movie by Robert De Niro and Dustin Hoffman called Wag the Dog. Yeah, yeah. Remember that one where the president of America's uh, is popularity is quite low, so they they get a, a Hollywood pro director to uh, orchestrate war, to fake a war. Yeah, and it was a war with Al in Al I think with Albania, and uh, like weeks later they show people in bars drinking beers and have T-shirts on them printed "Fuck Albania." Yeah. <laughs> they really bought into the narrative. There was like yeah. no war going on. Well, uh, if you listen to Tucker Carlson, here's a voice crying in the wilderness. He's saying basically that's what the Ukraine uh, war is, it's, though it's a real war and people are really dying. But what's going on there? What are we really doing there? And why is it that anybody thinks it's any of our business? And I, I really value this guy because he, he is this contrary voice saying, take a second look at what everyone is telling you. Scary. I, I think it's very healthy to, to uh, that second or third look might still emphasize what you're thinking originally, but I think you should still do it. I think it, it needs to uh, um, uh, 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 to do it in, in in such a way that you keep verifying because you could end up uh, thinking what you sort of been thinking all along, or you might sort of change your mind. So I think it's very very important. Mm. Mm. Uh, this is this is a conversation that's going to take us into sort of politics. People are still uh, no, they love you, but they're not they're not very happy with your political views. But I think we we've put it to, to rest. I mean, she's Mondo is is, is quite um, um, uh, you know uh, keep talking about the same. Well, people are different, you know. Uh, if, if 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 Bob uh, has a different con conviction because of whatever narrative is free. I mean, why do people need to to keep talking about this area? I'm not, I'm not sure why. Yeah, I, I only bring this, I only talk about this when people bring it up to me. I don't think it's the appropriate uh, subject matter for, for this. Uh, yeah. So I, I do uh, think it's, it's strangely ironic that you're accusing me of being anti-democratic when you're trying to shut me up. Exactly. Well, that seems very, very strange. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm not going to use neutrals. I, I will continue. My very good friendship with, with Bob is, is somebody that I'm really, really happy to have in my life as, a, as a, somebody I'm learning from and as a good friend, as a good human being. 
and he's not exactly like me, which is brilliant because I don't want a copy of me. Uh, otherwise, I'd be talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've convinced him of certain things and he's convinced me of other things. And this is how beautiful and rich life should be. We talk, we continue to talk to each other. I think um, uh, pushing somebody aside is, is wrong because what have you changed? You're not engaged in any conversation. How do you change anybody's point of view if you cast them aside? It's just not going to it's not going to do anything. Yeah, I uh, have my life has been so enriched by actively uh, interacting with friends who are, uh, without exaggeration, uh, who include communists, Satanists, Moonies, Muslims, Jews, almost anything you can think of. Uh, I I'll seek out viewpoints that I don't hold and that especially sound strange to me because I know the stranger it sounds, I must be missing something. And so let me see if I can explore what someone is saying as sympathetically as I can. I, I will at least understand them better, but I may find myself convinced as I often have. So I, I don't... Uh, accept or reject people based on their conformity to my opinions <laughs> that's uh, i would uh, sort of hate to think anything like that was happening <laughs> and i'm very glad that we're gonna end up on a very light note and uh, constellation because obviously he's got a, a great sense of humor he said vote for mr price make crit critical faculty great again <laughs> <laughs> that was always great. <laughs> well, you know, and, and, and this is one thing I think humanity should not lose is um, the, the, the interaction, the fact that we can discuss things through uh, despite our differences. I think having differences is, is a great thing. Um, uh, echo chambers are quite boring. They're very boring. That's why fringe thinkers... And people who are not main, like you talked about Bart Ehrman, he's a mainstream, he's a text, textual scholar, and that's the consensus. And there comes few people that will see things from a slightly different angle. These people might end up the mainstream going in the future mm -hmm. uh, because something will come along to prove their point of view beyond that, for example. And they go, uh oh, what was um, uh, at some point, uh, a, a, a really fringe view, and that happens a lot in science, by the way. Uh, and somebody comes with a wacky idea, and then, wow! Actually, uh, relativity uh, is 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 how Einstein understood it, and not uh, some other uh, person that lived, you know, two hundred years before him. Uh, even though it might have been not uh, very commonsensical at the time, like, you know, where you're thinking about time doesn't actually exist and it's quite, it's relative and light bends and, and crazy stuff like that. And you go, or uh, um, quantum mechanics, the uh, first theory that when it first came out, people said that, no, that's magic. Even Einstein himself didn't like quantum mechanics and he called it spooky action at a distance. He was not convinced. Uh, then the, the you know the Copenhagen interpretation it, it completely now gets sort of uh, explained away, and if, eventually Einstein had to sort of play ball. Still wasn't hundred percent convinced. He thought there was a hidden va variable out there, and he might still be right. This is the funny thing. Einstein maybe in two hundred years might be uh, proved right that there might be a hidden variable in quantum mechanics. We don't know, but. Uh, science and, 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 and academia and thoughts and um, intellectual discussion can only be pro progressed through throwing of ideas into the melting pot of ideas for us to probe and examine and understand by saying, hey, I've got the truth. You are a crackpot. Uh, end of story. I'm, I'm not allowed to talk to you. You can't have... You can't voice your opinion, then call myself democratic while I'm doing it. it is insanity, in my opinion. You know, I'm glad uh, she said that, though, because it really is a salutary reminder of the whole premise of what we're doing here. Uh, it uh, shows the need for it. 
And 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 you get uh, a gentleman like the dust uh, dusty dud. I enjoy Doctor Bob. I don't agree with him politically on everything, but I don't go for him for politic. I listen to him about religious history and love learning history. Amen. Bingo. Bingo. And that's how life should be. You can't say, well, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't like the shape of your head and therefore I'm not listening to you. Or I don't like uh, you're, you're a Republican or you believe that, uh, you know, something. And then uh, therefore everything you're going to say from this point on is discredited. That's mm. wrong. Mm. Oh, thank you so much, Bob. As ever, I've enjoyed the conversation. And oh, uh, thank the, you. Yeah, the audience have given us a couple of um, ideas for uh, future episodes. We've got Satan. We've got the pagan origins of um, of Judaism. Here we go, a couple of episodes to, to be scheduled in the future. Mm -hmm. Fun, fun, fun. Great. Well, thank you very much, folks. Uh, we've reached the end of our episode today. I'd like to thank everybody who contributed to the uh, broadcast uh, uh, through Super Chat or even through in, uh, nice questions that made us sort of think about a thing or two. Um, until the next episode, which is going to be in five weeks' time, I'm going to be away in Europe. Um, 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 I wish you uh, safety and happiness. Mm -hmm.